Japan's history is undeniably interesting with its unique culture. Samurais, daimyos, Meiji restoration and all of that. But not that many know of the turbulent and vibrant economic periods that Japan has enjoyed and suffered after the World War II. Incidents of toilet paper hoarding, land prices of more than $6,000 for just a postcard size area, infinite money printing and more. So get your beverage of choice and sit back to enjoy this video of the economic history of Japan. Japan suffered huge losses from World War II. Nearly 3 million died and a quarter of the whole national wealth gone. Reduce the burning fields and ash, recovery was something that was hard to see. Japan being the losing side was occupied by the US established GHQ or General Headquarters, led by Douglas MacArthur. Fearing the rise of communism, US made its mission to democratize Japan by establishing free markets and empower the middle class. The way this was done was by first dissolving the Zaibatsu, which in other words were the monopolies and oligopolies. Some of these had names such as Mitsui, Mitsubishi, Sumitomo, Nomura and so on. Sound familiar? Yes. These behemoths were dissolved, but they found a way to regroup years after which is the reason the biggest holding companies' names you see in Japan today are mostly grandchildren of the Saibatsu. They go a long way, even before the war. Other measures the GHQ took was a land reform, where government purchased and sold land to independent farmers, and labor market reform, which made labor unions stronger. These were all measures that helped to create and empower the middle class that was to help Japan's economy recover and accomplish the feat we today call the Japanese economy miracle. But things didn't start rosy. To fund the war, Japan had issued a huge amount of over 200% of its GDP in war bonds, which is actually close to the level of debt that Japan has again accumulated today. But that's a different story. Anyway, these war bonds that Japan had issued during the war matured at the same time as soldiers who had been paid in the military currency went in to exchange them for real money. This caused a sudden peak in the currency circulation. However, Japan's industries hadn't still recovered from the war, so there was a shortage of general goods. A lot of cash, but no available goods, led to hyperinflation. To deal with this inflation, Japanese banks did something unprecedented. They ordered a freeze on people's deposits while announcing that they were going to transit to a new currency, the new yen. Because the old yen deposits were frozen and people couldn't withdraw but only a small sum of money, and after the transit period, old yen would lose its value, what ended up happening was that the out-of-reach money people had in their accounts would lose its value. And just to take things even further, a wealth tax was introduced where if you had over 100,000 yen on your account, you were subject to a tax from 20 to 90% depending on the amount. So basically, this was the government defaulting on its debts, on the expense of its people. After a couple of years, the deposit freeze was lifted, and with it, the inflation returned. This time, a US economist, Joseph Dodge, created an austerity policy package called Dodge Plan. Basically a plan to tighten spending and balance budgets. This forced the Japan's economy into deflationary recession. However, clearing the economy of bad debts and the restructuring helped to create a foundation for companies to grow. The following Korean War created demand for Japanese companies which helped boost the economy, creating the first stepping stone for the Japanese economic miracle. With the demand from the US troops fighting in the Korean War, Japanese industries started to recover and grow. Employment in the manufacturing industry increased 
and with the help of the labor unions, so did workers' wages. This led to increased consumption, leading to a virtuous cycle that stimulated Japanese domestic demand. This was the beginning for an era of outstanding growth. Wash machines, refrigerators and televisions became new household staples. Going forward, Japan experienced a particularly big growth during the Tokyo Olympics of 1964. During these years, the average real GDP growth was a whopping 9.1%. The Olympic mania encouraged a series of public work projects, such as the famous Shinkansen bullet train and many new highways. This mania also extended to the stocks and securities, in which from 1957 to 1961, in only four years, the amount in investment funds grew ten times, leading to a new catchphrase, bye-bye banks, hello investment funds. However, as often happens, these kinds of highs usually wear off, which started to happen after the Olympics. This and a policy of monetary tightening made the economy slip into a brief slump. For Yamaichi Securities trading company, this was the last nail to the coffin, as it was already on the brink of insolvency. And this is where something extraordinary happened. The Bank of Japan announced that it would lend to Yamaichi as much as they needed without any collateral. Basically, the government was saying that this company was too big to fail. But this was only a fraction of what was to come after. Despite this, however, the economy turned on and focus started to shift to a new problem. Tokyo was getting too crowded and countryside too desolate. To solve this issue, the Prime Minister candidate Tanaka Kakue made an election promise for remodeling the Japanese archipelago with an intention to connect big cities with the countryside. The areas that were candidates to the remodeling were soon rushed with opportunistic investors that started hoarding land which then sent land prices soaring, also causing inflation. Adding insult to injury, the first oil crisis stemming from the Yom Kippur War in the Middle East causes an increase of over 70% in the oil price, putting a halt to the remodeling project and worsening the inflation. The inflation got so bad, it was 31.4% in 1974. This would mean that if you had a nest egg of $100,000, at the end of the year, it would have a purchasing power of only $68,600. This oil crisis would also spark the infamous toilet paper commotion, which just shows the power of group psychology. It all started with the Minister of Economy, Yasuhiro Nakasone, advising people to save paper, which started a rumor that paper was going to run out. Then shortly after, a regular supermarket in Osaka that had nothing to do with this statement had an advertisement banner that read Toilet paper so cheap it's gonna run out. Advertising cheap toilet paper was normal as many shops used it to lure customers who would then buy other products as well. And this is where the gear switched to the next level. Shortly there was a line of over 300 housewives and in just two hours this discount toilet paper actually sold out. After this, people started to complain that the store didn't have the discount toilet paper anymore, and then quickly turned to buying the regular price toilet paper, which was also soon sold out. A local newspaper got a whiff of this commotion, and soon the headlines read, Toilet paper price doubles, which further led to more people rushing to hoard this newly revalued asset. While this craziness was going on, the fundamentals behind toilet paper production hadn't actually changed at all. However, because the toilet paper manufacturers knew that they could use this commotion to their benefit, they artificially reduced the market supply by withholding some toilet paper in their warehouse, as they would be able to sell it more expensive later on. 
the government was worried that this could get out of control. So they convinced the toilet paper manufacturers to ship their excess stock to the market. Retail shops would build huge display mountains of toilet paper to show that there were no shortage. And soon after, the commotion was gone. The real problem, however, was the inflation. To put an end to it, the Bank of Japan tightened monetary policy, which in turn slowed the economic growth, putting an end to the Japanese economic miracle in the year 1975. This was also the time that Japan started to issue bonds on a regular basis, creating the start for the biggest debt nation to come. Despite the growing debt, Japan was still an economic powerhouse and a net exporter. Soon, however, the country would be hit by another oil crisis in 79, this time caused by the Iranian Revolution. This time Japan would figure out how to make this crisis into an opportunity. Because of the rise in oil prices, Japan first restructured its production, reducing its dependency on oil by shifting to nuclear energy and producing more fuel-efficient cars. This is also the period when Japan started to mass-produce semiconductors and computers that would find its way to all the corners of the world. This exporting had netted Japan a huge trade surplus and its economy grew to the size of the third biggest in the world, a title that formerly belonged to Germany. But as we know, someone's trade surplus is another one's deficit. And this another one was the US. Another reason to this deficit was the appreciation of the dollar from 1980 to 1985, which made Japanese exports cheap. On the losing side of this trade, however, was US companies such as Caterpillar, IBM and Motorola, who started campaigning and lobbying the government to intervene. In 1985, this bore fruit in the form of the Plaza Accord, where the US dollar was devalued. More expensive Japanese yen would mean that Japanese exports would now be more expensive for foreigners. So the Bank of Japan decided to compensate by increasing the domestic demand. To increase domestic demand, Bank of Japan did what they know best. Loosen the monetary policy by cutting rates and doing more quantitative easing. Which basically means printing money and throwing it at the market. And the markets love this. All this cheap money went straight into the stock market and the real estate, inflating a huge bubble. The Ginza district in Tokyo had peak land prices of 36,500,000 yen for a square meter, which would be equal for paying about 600,000 yen or about 6,000 US dollars for a land the size of a postcard. However, the domestic markets weren't enough to satisfy the hunger of this newfound capital. And soon enough, Japanese were gobbling up real estate and other assets all over the world. Such as the Hollywood studios, famous golf courses and even the famous Rockefeller Center. Many even speculated that Japan would take over the US as the biggest economy in the world watching as its citizens and companies would buy properties and stocks through heavy leveraging. The Bank of Japan started to worry about the economy heating too much. To cool things down, the Bank of Japan started to gradually tighten monetary policy by raising the rates, which ironically pricked the bubble and threw a bucket of cold water over the speculators. People who had gotten accustomed watching their assets double in value now had to face the bitter truth that it was all a mirage. After the bubble popped, stocks would crash about 50% and land prices about 15-18%. to Companies, banks and individuals who had overextended themselves found themselves underwater. As the price dropped, everyone were scrambling to get out of the markets and those who were left holding the so-called hot potato would be in trouble. All of a sudden, banks and companies found themselves holding tons of bad debts that was threatening their solvency. So what could they do? 
If you guessed tamper their accounting books with various tricks, then you were correct. The banks and companies would sweep these bad bets under the rug in order to not lose trust. But word surely got out, and global trust towards Japanese banks and companies took a big hit. The accounting books were ordered to be revealed, and it was imminent that a lot of companies and some banks were to go out of business. However, as Yamaichi securities were bailed in the 60s, so would many companies be bailed again. But not Yamaichi securities. They went bankrupt in 97. Seems that sometimes you just don't get a second chance. But those companies that were deemed too important to fail were bailed by the government and banks. Making way for a new word that is zombie company. By bailing all of these companies that would have otherwise failed, created a sort of distorted market conditions, where the companies were artificially left alive through cheap money. Some argue that this was a substantial reason for the long stagnation period that we now call the lost decade, or lost decades, as Japan still haven't really recovered from this. Going towards the new millennium, Japan was yet stricken by the Asian financial crisis of 97 and the dot-com bubble in 2000. But these incidents had only limited impact on the already slumped Japan. During this Heisei recession, manufacturing started to escape from Japan to cheaper countries like China. Companies, not just in manufacturing, but other industries also started reducing costs by laying off workers or replacing full-time workers with temporary workers, who didn't get the same benefits and bonuses as regulars. Banks also experienced a big change but unlike workers who got downgraded, banks got buffed with something called Japanese Financial Big Bang. To put this in short, a whole lot of financial regulation was deregulated, making it easier for banks to do whatever. This also made it possible for the banks to regroup into these huge holding companies once again, which they did. But this time it's not called Zaibatsu, but Keretsu so I'm sure it must be a completely different thing. Also, the Bank of Japan started pumping money into the system and slashed the interest rates to near zero. From here, the economy started slowly growing again, but the public sentiment was that the economy was still bad, and the wealth gap started to be pointed out. The latest financial crisis of 2008 is probably still on many people's mind, irresponsible lending of the subprime loans and the securitization and derivatives led to a huge meltdown. This spilled over from the US to many countries and Japan was no exception. However, the way Japan suffered from this was a little bit unconventional. The thing is that Japanese financials weren't too exposed to the subprime loans, leaving them relatively unscathed. But because in times of crisis, Japanese yen is often seen as a safe haven asset. When the financial crisis hit, people started ditching the dollar and buying yen, which appreciated yen from 110 in 2008 to 76 yen in 2011. This is a good thing for all Japanese tourists who can now get more bang for their yen, but for Japanese exports, a different story. Going into the 2010s didn't bring any good news to Japan. In 2010, the European debt crisis, while not causing a panic, still sent shockwaves to Japan. And the next year Japan was hit by the Tohoku earthquake, tsunami and the resulting Fukushima nuclear disaster. The loss of life was devastating and the estimated economic cost rose over 235 billion US dollars, making it the costliest disaster in history. Since the early 90s, Japan's economy didn't seem to get a break. So in 2012, Shinzo Abe, who was now appointed as the prime minister for the second time, made a proposal to fix Japan's economy. This plan was to be known as Abenomics. Abenomics has three main policies, or arrows as they call it, which I'm going to break down. The first arrow is called Bold Monetary Policy. To put this simply, the Bank of Japan is going to buy enormous amounts of assets, such as bonds and stocks, from financial institutions, and then hope that the capital they provided will be used for giving loans to individuals and companies, 
which then accelerates the spending and stimulates the economy. I would argue that the way Bank of Japan has been printing money through quantitative easing and slashing interest rates to minus has certainly been bold. But whether or not this makes any sense to the normal citizens, I will leave for you to judge. The next arrow is called flexible fiscal policy, which in plain English is about increasing public spending in areas like construction, welfare and so on, in order to stimulate the economy. The funding for these public works are supposed to be funded with two methods. First, by value-added tax increases, where the VAT was hiked from 5% to 8% in 2014, with a plan to hike it again in 2015 to 10%. Come 2015, however, and due to weak consumption data, the tax hike was postponed to 2017. Come 2017, and a similar argument was made this time when Abe Prime Minister declared that there is a risk for a similar situation as the 2008 financial crisis. So, 2019 October it is then. Currently, at the making of this video, there is roughly 7 months until this day. Also, in addition to the value-added tax, the second method that Japan funds these public works is by the Bank of Japan buying bonds, which shouldn't be a surprise to anyone at this point. The last arrow of this policy would be translated into something along the lines of growth strategy, which is striving for lowering regulations, including more women and foreigners in the workforce, and increasing tourism and exports. Abenomics has been a really controversial topic, where some applaud it for a way to escape the deflation trap, or a good way to stimulate demand, whereas others criticize Abenomics for distorting markets and creating a wealth gap. Let's take a quick look at some economic indicators to see what has really happened during the Abenomics years starting from 2012. Looking at the Nikkei stock market index, we can see that stocks has soared about 150% from the start of Abenomics. Real estate also has steadily increased, at least in the big cities like Tokyo. Looking at the countryside real estate, however, the contrast is vast. What about the employment then? According to this chart from the CEIC data, the unemployment seems to have reached about 2.4%, which is ridiculously low compared to many other countries. But we have to take into account that the percentage of temporary workers have been increasing steadily since the bursting of the bubble and the financial crisis. Which means that you could have a part-time job at McDonald's for two days a week, but still be considered employed. So now that we know that unemployment is low, let's take a look at wages. Surely they have been rising, right? Normally, when an economy gets closer to full employment, the wages rise because companies have to fight for the workers by giving incentives like higher pay. But this didn't turn out to be the case. Looking at several graphs, anyone can notice that the pattern from 2012 has been a decrease in wages. While wages in general have been decreasing, Looking at the Gini coefficient index, where 1 is total inequality and 0 a perfect equality of wealth distribution, we can see that the trend has been towards a bigger wealth gap. However, when we looked at the situation after redistribution, this trend doesn't appear to be too strong. One reason to this income gap seems to be location, as wages in Tokyo has risen a lot compared to the other prefectures of Japan. What about inflation then? The 2% inflation has been obsession for the Bank of Japan all these years. The Bank of Japan accomplished this inflation target briefly in 2014 when the inflation rate jumped to 4%. But the reason for this seems to be the increase in the VAT tax and cheap yen which have made many products more expensive to purchase. Lastly, let's look at what has been happening with the debt levels of the country and individuals. First, for households, the increase of debt has been small but gradual. But hold your breath, because here comes the national debt. Ever since the bubble, the debt has increased and today, Japan has a national debt which is over 250% of its GDP, which makes it the biggest 
debt nation in the world. Also since the start of Abenomics, Bank of Japan has multiplied the amount of their balance sheet by buying bonds and stocks, which they largely hold to this day. Looking at all this data, I think that at least what we can say about Abenomics is that while succeeding in inflating stocks and real estate by taking a huge amount of debt, it still hasn't really made the life of an ordinary person any better. It is a common argument that there is no problem with this debt because almost all of it is owned by Japanese themselves. And the country can't go bankrupt as it can always just print more money. This is essentially the logic behind modern money theory. Whether or not this is true is not for debate in this video. Hopefully you found this topic interesting and learned something from it. The sources for the charts and data I used are in the description, so feel free to check them out yourself. Please like, subscribe and comment as this kind of interaction helps me make more videos like these in the future. Thanks for watching.